In this episode, David meets up with T.C. DeWitt of the Studio Demands It podcast to talk about what it's like to tell a story when your main character doesn't talk. Hello and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am David Geisler, your co-host, and tonight I am without my regular co-host. I am with a very special guest, Mr. T.C. DeWitt. How are you, T.C.? Hello, David. Thank you for having me on the show here. I am so excited about this episode. I, I am, am too. I, I, I kidnapped Kate and I locked her away for... She's fine. <laughs> she's fine. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Um, <laughs> we opened the window, gave her a bowl of water. <laughs> she's, she's very well taken care of, so I could be here today. What a great way to start off. That's the best first impression I could have gave. <laughs> Hi, I'm mildly abusing I, I, the host. I kidnapped a woman. No, no. I, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, no. Actually, well, to speak to that point, uh, TC, I think I can kind of expand off that. Um, um, specifically the kidnapping. The kidnapping. No, no, totally joking. <laughs> Usually, or oftentimes, when I have a guest on the show, mm-hmm. uh, it's because Kate and I will have a hole in our availability. You yes, know? yes. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to have extra conversations with people that I never would have expected to talk change to change the chemistry change it up just a little bit it's it's a blast we've been able we've been fortunate enough that when those holes happen um I've been able to you know we have a we have a team of people that write uh, for our blogs on our website perhaps you've seen perhaps you haven't I'm not quite sure it's totally okay um <laughs> You've read every word, right? I have it memorized. What did and you feel about the second bag. paragraph of blog number three? There was a comma splice, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's wonderful. We've been able to bring other expanded people from the AZP team onto the show. Um, I've been able to interview people that I never would have known uh, before. You know, I've had I, I had an episode where I had two, I guess, fans or listeners on. Yeah. And we talked about our favorite emotional moments. That was a real treat. But this episode's a touch different. Um, this episode was not because there was a hole. I wanted we've been putting this episode together trying yes. to get our schedules together trying for to a month up. or two now yeah. and the reason is is that you are the host of another six five show the studio demands it the studio demands it yes Indeed. myself and jim yep absolutely i am v- so proud of that show i'm so happy for 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 six five which I, a lot of our listeners kind of know that zelda you know studios top hat balloon show these other shows that they're kind of um the beginnings of this larger company this ne- larger this network, network yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely um, and so I'm sure I know for a fact that for the past couple episodes and most of this past year, people have been hearing studio. Probably they've actually heard your voice before. I just realized. Oh, good. In commercial the promos, breaks. The commercial in the commercial breaks. breaks. <laughs> all right, all right. End of ad. End of ad. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's that, you. That that uh, that commercial was a microcosm of how we we do the show, where it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> Jim and I. Like initially, we actually did several versions of that commercial until I sent it to you. Yeah, because it was initially. The studio's demanding we do a 60 second commercial ad, Jim. What do they need to know? And Jim is oh, clever. Was so put on the spot. He's like, uh, uh, uh listen to uh, the show. I'm like, all right, I'm going to script half of this. I bet you it was because he was, he had that timer thing going. He's like, oh, I yep. only have 10 yep. seconds to say something. Uh, but yes, I, I'm very excited to be a part of the 6 5 network to, yes. to have a chance to work with you in any capacity is always a, a, a bonus. Um, well, yeah, you and I have, have been friends forever, and um, we've been fortunate enough to work with each other professionally for the past oh, yeah. five or six years Stage, or Stage, screen, yeah. recording. Indeed. Yep. And uh, to that point, you had an episode. So Studio Demands It, why don't you let the... Uh, uh, I've talked about it a little bit yeah. on this show, but why don't you give your pitch about what that show's all about? Well, uh, Studio Demands it, it... Well, I'll actually talk about not just what it's about, but how it came to be was sure. that uh, my Jim and I are great friends. We've known each other for a good number of years. Whenever we get together, we're both filmmakers. We mm-hmm. we write, direct, act, produce all the time. And we constantly have conversations about the movies we've seen, particularly big franchises, big Hollywood pic- pictures, and complain about them. <laughs> like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? You know... Most of the internet comment section anywhere. You're just doing it. In real I would have done it this way, and um, <laughs> it, it it started with a conversation with Star Trek Into Darkness was the one that that created the show. Essentially, I could imagine a conversation about that because movie. I I had my joke about that is I had no idea I was a Trekkie until I saw Star Trek Into Darkness and got upset and got upset. <laughs> I had a very similar experience. It's I I was sitting in the theater. Give, uh, my history lesson is getting longer here. Sorry. And as that movie's playing out, I'm getting 
<laughs> indignant with this thing. Like, <laughs> what What did they th- <laughs> cross in my arm? I'm looking yeah. around and people are like happily watching the film. I'm like, why is no one as upset as I am? Maybe. Oh my goodness. I'm a tricky. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah, totally. Right. Uh, I think maybe half the audience didn't see <laughs> Wrath of Khan. Or yeah. Something. And, but in complaining about that one night, Jim was like, okay, well, what would you do? Yeah. The studio clearly said, you have to remake Wrath of Khan. You guys were just hanging out? Yeah, we were just right. hanging out. And he's like, well, how would you do it? I We actually played the movie. Yeah. And for two and a half hours as the movie played, I pitched the dif- difference. Different I would do. He bounced off that. We went back and forth. And Interesting. By the end of the movie that was playing, we had come up with an entirely new film that would have satisfied what we assumed were the demands of Paramount Pictures. Right. And after all that was said and done, Jim was like, "This is a podcast. Really, we should do this. This is a show." And I was like, "Yeah, let's do it." And it just wow. He he flipped the switch. Yeah, yeah. And it was just timed perfectly for you looking for contributors to the six five network. You've you've been you and I have been podcasting for about the same amount of time. Yeah. Over a decade most likely. Yeah. Yeah. I I did over two hundred episodes of The Rewatchman, mm-hmm. which is still available on on iTunes and whatnot if you want to hear me review films. Yep. And uh, you did one. You did a show with uh, Ghost Hat Media, which I was a big fan of. Yes, it was. It was kind of a one and done. It was like a limited release because you did all fifty Disney 56. films. Fifty six. It was the Disney Animation Studios podcast yep. where we watched uh, Jeff Bell and I, yep. the the uh, owner and proprietor of uh, Ghost Hat Media, did Snow White to to I think at the Moana. time was Moana. Yeah. We've since done Wreck It Ralph too. The canonical official. Disney Animation Studio films. Yeah, we did every one of them, and <clears throat> yeah, it was a finite series because there's just that library, and that oh, that was such a phenomenally fun show to do. That was one of the first shows where I found myself being a fan of oh, it. Thank you. In That's that, like, you know, you always listen to your friends' shows, you listen to your co professionals' shows, fellow collaborators, yeah, fellow yeah. collaborators, um, but. But that was one where I would, well, I, I, that's the first time I ever commented in for like a podcast, you know, <laughs> like you sending, for that. sending comments. And it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. So when we were looking for more shows, um, I re- for 6.5, when we decided to do 6.5 and had that Zelda would be kind of, I mean, essentially like the flagship. It's one season ahead of all the other shows right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, but when we were looking for more, I was like, okay, I really want to work with those Top Hat guys. They're funny. Yeah. And immediately I was, I was like, and, and. I remember having a meeting with my collaborators at the time when we were just building some of the the infrastructure of Six Five, and I slapped down a Disney podcast and I slapped down your other. You did a video series, uh, one minute rewatch, one minute rewatch, yeah. and I showed my collaborators those things and I said, "This man has to make a show for us." And so I reached out, and that must have been around the same time that yep. you had this conversation with Jeff, which with, is wonderful. With uh, with Jim, Jim, Jim. I'm so yep. sorry. Oh yeah, Jeff, Jim, Jeff, one. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it worked out perfectly, and I'm I still have. That you know, pots on all, all the plans. Everyone, the good, the best intentions, right? Of doing a video series as well. I, I, I oh really? I really still want to do that. I have the itch to do it. Um, but uh, the the podcast is is so much fun to do. We're yeah, we're accidentally having a meeting at the top of this episode, and so I want to tell our audience that today we're going to be talking about. We've titled the episode "A Silent Protagonist." A, a silent protagonist. We're yes. going to be discussing you as a screenwriter, be, coming off of you. You live in California. You work as a screenwriter, filmmaker, director, producer, professionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but from that from that lens of storytelling, we want to talk today about uh, how to tell a story when your main character technically and that we can get into it mm-hmm. doesn't talk yeah specifically to, and i know this is a little a weird trying to figure out the topic exactly mm-hmm. that would create a good crossover here by the way i'm still going to circle back to studio demands oh, but i just wanted to let our audience oh, no, know what fine. we're talking about yeah we're, and i'm happy to talk about that in in kind of conjunction with the studio demands and and, and how what that show is and how i uh what i'm bringing to the table today wonderful is a uh, discussing and i think i pitched it at you that um i can't remember well, either way, we, let's do it, we let's came do it up- this way. Let's do it this way. Full disclosure: TC and I got we we arranged our schedules because you came in from California. Um, we had a very fun project, creative project yesterday that we worked on together, yep. and we were able to get together this morning. This is a Sunday morning episode. We don't, yeah. I don't usually record Sunday mornings. Usually My voice isn't even awake yet. I know there's a bit of that. There's a bit of that. <laughs> but because we knew that we would physically be in the same space, I said I really, really want. I've been wanting you on Zelda. But uh, over on Studio Demands it a couple episodes ago, you guys did a video game episode and a Mario and a Brothers Mario episode, episode, episode. It, it, the, which ended up being a lot of fun. The, the Super Mario Brothers episode. So actually, let's, go, let's talk Studio Demands it let's again. Let's do it, and then we'll bring it back around. Uh, the, the idea is 
the listeners will submit a demand. And we kind of have two different types of demands that'll happen where there'll be, this movie exists, how would you have done it differently? Yeah. And the other other side of it is, this movie should exist, how would you do it? Yeah. And it- Oh, uh, let me interject. Yeah. Uh, the listeners go to your website, studiodemanded.com, and mm-hmm. they we have a little form there where they literally submit an idea yeah. as if they are a studio requesting something, and the more ridiculous, the more difficult it is for you and Jim, <laughs> the, more and the more entertaining the episode yeah. is. And but yeah, when I say ridiculous, I mean like, what if, you know, we've never gotten this, but what if it's uh, Titanic 2 and Leonardo DiCaprio has, has to be to in come it. back. Yes, exactly. You know what I mean? It's it, f- having something like uh, Fantastic Beasts and saying, how would you have done Fantastic Beasts? Johnny Depp has to be in it. Right. It's like, ugh, actually, it's become a, a reoccurring joke that any time we do a property <laughs> Johnny that Johnny Depp, Depp was, in, was involved in the original, he has to still be involved. So, like, we have to do Lone Ranger. Johnny Depp has to, to be, be in it. It's because like, so many times in real Hollywood, there's a, an actor attached to something, and they know that there's a certain bankability yeah. on it, so you have to put somebody you in You have to put yeah. this per. You, know, you yeah. have to do another X-Men. Jennifer Lawrence has to be in it. Right. She doesn't want to be there. Well, she has to be in it. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, and so, uh, if, so through the conversations of the video game one and the Mario Brothers one, mm-hmm. uh, there was a little seed dropped where you mentioned something like, "Oh, you know, David does a Zelda podcast," and what, or you started to talk about Zelda in the yes. video game one. And, and I, I said, think you were like, "Oh, let's not," or let's something. Let's not. Yeah. And With- I remember listening to that episode in the editing bay before we were putting it out, and I was like, "Ding, ding, ding, ding! We ding. should do this. We're gonna do <laughs> another Zelda podcast episode on Studio Demands It if mm-hmm. if TC is interested in that." But then. Also, I want to get TC over on Zelda. So after the, recording this episode, we're going to be recording a Studio Demands Studio episode, episode. And I'll be a guest on your show. That's right. And that's great. So, okay, there's all of that. Studio Demands It. So we're today now going to be talking about uh, um, Link in general, mm-hmm. not having a voice, but I want to do some listener feedback first. Oh, TC. certainly. Yeah. Fire right. away. Was there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, I'm just right, happy cool. to be here and uh, talking with you. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. All right, so let's see. Today I have a lot of YouTube uh, feedback. We get um, we get a lot of iTunes reviews, which is crazy helpful. It always helps. Oh, yeah, uh, it always helps. I the, just started that, recommending that, and Studio demands it. Like, throw us a bone. The, even if it's a negative review, it helps. <laughs> the the reviews on iTunes, even more than the star ratings, the reviews are one of the dominant factors in the algorithm for iTunes. Mm-hmm. Or actually, I guess it's called Apple Podcasts these days. It's yeah. not technically iTunes anymore. Um, okay, but however, over on YouTube here for our... Oh, we did an episode that you may or may not be familiar with about Beyond Good and Evil. Do you remember that game? Um, it was around the GameCube days, PlayStation 2 days. I can picture the art for it because I remember the art being different. It's not, yes. a, it's not a Zelda game. Yes. Yeah, it was that. It was the gal... Yes. Um, her name was Jade. Mm-hmm. There's Beyond Good and Evil 2 sequel coming out in a little bit. That's probably why it's still in my consciousness. Like yeah. it's, sometimes it'll pop up on YouTube lists or something like that. Anyways, it was our first time ever doing an episode where we didn't talk about a Zelda game. But yeah. once a season, we're going to do Zelda-like episodes. Okay. We'll probably we'll do Star Fox Adventures next season. We'll yes. probably do Okami the next season. You know, we'll take it from there. I, honestly, I think even Oceanhorn is a good one to, t- to try. Ocean Horn 2 just came out for Apple Arcade or something too, by the way, which is, I really want to try it. So over here on our Beyond Good and Evil episode, season two, episode 19, Tim Phillips says, the podcast is great, Dave. Oh, thank you, Philip, <laughs> <laughs> or Timmy, Timothy. Uh, you need to get a Nintendo Switch and play Cadence of Hyrule. Fair enough. I still don't have a Nintendo Switch. I happily play Breath of the Wild on my Wii U. Yeah. Link's Awakening remake came out on Switch. I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. <laughs> get um, on it. Cadence of Hyrule. Do you have a Switch or anything like that? I don't. No, yeah. the... I, and we can discuss that further as we're we're talking about yeah, yeah. my my love and affinity for Zelda for video games in general. But uh, many a year ago, as I as I ventured into the world of professional creativity, yes, uh, a creative that I generally admire said, "If you want to be in a creative field and you own a PlayStation or a Nintendo, you might as well have a drug problem." <laughs> Because <laughs> it will it will time suck. You yes. will invest in Red Dead Redemption instead of working. Indeed. And so I I I I tend to limit my video gaming. Um, so I don't own a Switch. I don't my yeah. I own a an Xbox 360. Right. Uh, I still have my Nintendo 64 and play Ocarina of Time often. Yeah, I can't. I I'm exactly in the same situation. I just I can't play video games. I love There's video so games. many I love. But, um I literally schedule my video game time so as to not play too much. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I mean I was, like right now we're going through a link to the past for our season finale. So it, having that structure is nice. I'll be like, okay, I'm, I have to get to a certain mm-hmm. dungeon tonight. I'll play for 2 hours and then I I'll wait a week and, and I'll get in play. again. You know, left, you know, in my own life I only game I don't know, maybe a couple hours a week, honestly. It's it's for the safety of my creativity although i will say there will be occasions where i'll be 
so creatively drained from a big project and I just want to zone out and I, I don't even want to watch like Netflix or anything yeah. and I'll just stick in I'll play Ocarina of Time I'll play Mario 64 uh, I'll play Dr. Mario I'll play right. Minecraft and just veg and I yeah. love it just disappear into it no I hear you yeah. I hear you. And I mean, the the thing is, like, I do wish there were five hours extra a day because I think there are some really phenomenal art filled games oh, out there right gosh. now that I'm yeah. missing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to speak poorly about video games at all. It's, no, it's, no, it's I, love there. I love them. I love them. Like, here's an example. Um, City Skylines is essentially the newest version of like a SimCity yes. type game. Yes. I want to play it so bad. It's in my wish list on my Steam. But you know. I won't buy it <laughs> because I know it's going to take over my life. Like when I was in college, Roller Coaster Tycoon, it would be like, oh, we've got an exam tomorrow or i got to get a project. No, I'm just going to stay up all night and build fences <laughs> around my pathways. You know, it's that, right? And, yeah. And that's yeah. a beautiful, wonderful, creative thing. It's a sandbox, you know, to be able to make those things, but it can happen. Sorry, I'm so derailing Cadence you from of Hyrule. Well, I asked, do you have Switch? And Cadence of Hyrule was a game that came out. Um, it was It's Zelda, not adjacent, but it's not in some of it might be kind of canon, but it essentially was made by another studio mm -hmm. and uh, it's a time-based rhythm game and it's uh, it's okay. cool. It's it's a it's a love letter to Zelda, maybe the same way that in some ways Hyrule Warriors is, though, mm -hmm. though anyway, we'll keep going. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Timothy, for that comment. And keep on moving. We're going to be, I just realized this is going to be a nine-hour episode <laughs> if we're not careful. So we're going to keep moving. Oh, Kenzie Potter over here on our Top 10 Towns episode, she said, so this is interesting. We, our, our listener feedback is always pretty positive for another Zelda podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you, you mentioned earlier, like what compels someone to comment on an episode. Yeah. And one, one of my favorite things for this show is Kate and I might build a top 10 list of items. My favorite thing is when people come in and go like, loved the list. For me, also this <laughs> item was one. Yes. Or for me, it was this. For me, it was that. And it just makes the conversation get larger. Yeah. You know, if we build a top 10, we're just doing it for the fun of it. We're not saying this is the ultimate it's definitive. 10. Our opinion is right. There's no argument. Don't at me. The only thing we love more is people chime in and saying, actually, I feel this way or I do feel that way or that was cool. Mm -hmm. So I love it. So I think there's a bit of one of those, if I may. Kenzie Potter over here on YouTube on our Top 10 Towns episode, she said, I hate to be a goober, <clears throat> but I'm fairly sure the overworld of Majora's Mask is called Termina. And then the town y'all are talking about is actually Clacktown. Nonetheless, it's super interesting to hear you both talk about your favorite aspects of Zelda games and how different your gameplay styles are from each other, as well as many other fans like myself. Keep up the great work. Kenzie, thank you so much. She's absolutely right. You I are, yeah. completely, always, constantly, accidentally refer to all of Majora's Mask as Termina. I was actually for a while I was calling it Termania. Yeah. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> but that's what it is to be a Zelda fan. Sometimes you say things wrong and, and it's okay. We can have the whole Ocarina Ocarina conversation if you want. So I said Ocarina <laughs> in episode one and had some very polite comments uh, mm -hmm. saying it's, that generally it's Ocarina. Yeah. And so I've been saying Ocarina since. And I couldn't help that when you said Ocarina just now, I was like, oh, yeah. baby. <laughs> ATM machine. <laughs> Perfectly fine. So, yeah, ATM, the, yeah, the ATM machine machine or the a, the automatic telling machine machine. Makes my skin crawl. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenzie, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess I can discuss my love of that Majora's Mask later but we're reviewing so kate and i did ocarina of time this season mm -hmm. we're, we're doing a link to the past right now because we it's our game of shame that we neither of us ever finished ah, <clears throat> and for okay. so many people it's a favorite full disclosure a year ago i didn't even care for that game very much oh my gosh yeah the super nintendo one yeah i'm playing through it right now with fresh eyes open eyes and um i'm liking it i'm actually i'm seeing why people loved it, it so much as far as i knew being the, I'm not like a hardcore gamer, hardcore Zelda fan. Before Ocarina of Time, yeah. Link to the Past was considered the best game. Certainly, yeah, yeah, okay. in release order, yeah, yeah certainly, yeah, certainly, yeah. Uh, yeah it, it changed the game, and it certainly it did. I said certainly so many times just now, <laughs> and it absolutely did. Um, so I'm liking it, but next season we're definitely going to play Majora's. one or two of the Oracle games, the Game Boy games. <sighs> yeah, and Majora's Mask is in the in the queue for one of our I, review episodes. Majora's Mask is. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about that game is is such an anomaly of Zelda. Yeah. It is an anomaly of adventure games. It is for as quote unquote bad as it did when it first came out, right. what it means to people now. That's uh, that's a and uh, yeah. Majora's Mask is not in one of my top 3 favorite Zelda games, mm -hmm. but I have um a, v a very special place in my heart for Majora's Mask. Yeah. And when I say special place, that's not at the top of the list, but it's a special place. It's over here. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I once said, you know, Mi Miyamoto was the main 
force. There were many gentlemen or many team members working on Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. Miyamoto, Miyamoto was kind of the, the top of the, the tree. Then uh, there were two other gentlemen, Kazumi and this other guy named Aiji Anuma. Mm -hmm. um, Kazumi went on to make uh, Mario games. I just re learned recently from a, from our most recent, from two episodes ago. No, our most recent episode, Zelda 64. Yeah. Um, um, and Aiji Anuma was the one that built the water temple for Ocarina of Time, the infamous water Bastard. temple. Ig <laughs> Anuma, Ig Anuma was the main director for Majora's Mask. Oh, excellent! I. Oh G. my Anuma. gosh, that makes sense. I know, right? But the mask, everything's oh, a puzzle. Uh, water, you, you, the guy who programmed one of the a water temple gets to do a whole game. Yeah. How hard is that game? How about be? a whole game as a water temple? <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, right? Yes. But honestly, just another little tidbit, TC, because I feel like you may not know this, but our listeners kind of do. I've spoken about it in the past. I just want to say it quickly. Um, Ig Anuma was also the director for Wind Waker and Skyward Sword oh, and okay. Breath of the Wild. Okay. So like he, I sometimes joke, I have so much respect for Miyamoto. I think, you know, he's he's an icon and a legend. Yeah. And I've said, if Miyamoto, think about the difference between Ocarina and Majora. If Miyamoto is a master or a craftsman or whatever, mm -hmm. I feel like Anuma's kind of an artist. He that's a, doesn't mind express like yeah. changing things. That's a fair way to focusing good, on emotion. Good, good diff, uh, differentiation. Yeah, before between and that. honestly, even like with with art, as we both know, sometimes you don't nail it, but there's an there's things that are working, and mm -hmm. I feel like I feel that Majora's Mask is a work of art. Yeah, a piece of art. I'm with Anyways, you. let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. <laughs> uh, questions from a new Zelda fan. This was the episode where I had uh, Dan McCoy on. Full disclosure, I think Dan might have sent in a couple demands over to Studio Demands It. They may yes. pop up in season two, Studio Demands It. We don't yeah, know. I think they will. Uh, there's already been discussion, at least of one of his. Indeed. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so over on uh, season two, episode 20, he was my guest. And Hyrule Gamer said, another main amazing episode over here on YouTube. I love every single episode I watch, and I'm always waiting for that next one to come out. I make Zelda videos myself, and whilst I am writing scripts and editing, I almost always have your podcast on, as I need some noise in the room. Well, I'm so happy that we could provide noise, Hyrule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, what better way to do it than have a Zelda pet podcast on? Phenomenal stuff to everyone behind the podcast. David, Kate, Celeste, Roberts, Dan, who's on this episode, and anyone else involved. Hyrule Gamer, thank you so much. That's his. That's the name of his channel. I guess I'll give him a little plug here. Hyrule Gamer over on YouTube. I feel like... I feel like I've seen Hyrule Gamer videos. I might. I think my personal account might be subscribing to him. Maybe Zelda needs to as well. Oh, great. That was very cool. Very complimentary. A lot of love for you. Yeah. Off that same episode, questions from a new Zelda fan. Flowey... The flower, <laughs> Flowey the flower, eight two four four said, "Hi, I love this. I'm I am not Zelda from the Listen episode. Oh my goodness! Oh my gosh! We have we repeat repeat messages here from the the Listen episode. We did a Hey Listen Listener feedback episode, and I did on Twitter. This person must be not Zelda. Mm -hmm. um, I think that now I think that now that you're doing not Zelda episodes." In other words, Beyond Good and Evil. Right. I really want you to do Undertale. It is a similar game and you'd love it. Thanks. Now, that's interesting because my perception of Undertale is that it was a little bit more of like an Earthbound, maybe a little more RPG. I can, I, I don't have, I've never played it. I'm familiar with it mm -hmm. very fuzzily. Um, but uh, good, I love Undertale. it. That's a great recommendation. Indeed. I knew. Yeah. We'll put it on the list for sure. And honestly, I think some might even argue. Earthbound's interesting because it, it feels a bit like an adventure role-playing game, whereas Zelda's an, an, an adventure game, not yes. a role-playing game. You're not rolling metaphorical dice to see if you've attacked or not. You're literally swinging a sword. Hence, right. it's like an RPG, the Zelda games, but it's more of an adventure game. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh, another one from questions from a new Zelda fan. Joey Bergermeyer <laughs> says, yes, another Zelda podcast! Exclamation point. You guys always make top quality podcasts, and I love it. Thank you so much, and any chance you'll post the podcast on Spotify would be nice to be able to listen to your podcast while at work. Much love, Joey. Joey, I can speak to this. And actually, we had a gentleman working with us yesterday on our project, and he was like, oh, what's your show, and wanted to subscribe. He went straight to Spotify, Yeah. and I had to tell him, oh, we're not on Spotify yet. And this is why, listeners, it's I, I keep trying. So we, all of the, all of the 6.5 Media shows, <laughs> I personally handwrite the XML. I mean, I literally <laughs> type it into a text editor. <laughs> and what, in other words, we don't use a service like, I don't know, Libsyn or Podbean or, or who knows what, right? You're actually in there. Yeah, it's writing it in. It's great. I love it because I get to get, I get to get really detailed with the code and make sure that like, for example, on uh, Apple Podcasts, the season information shows up correctly. Yes. And, uh, you know, the way the descriptions show up, we can control that a little bit. And I love that. Um, every time I submit another Zelda podcast to Spotify, so there's an option on Spotify. It's like, what, what service do you use? And there's like nine 
services that I'm sure those companies, they have a professional relationship with Spotify. There's mm-hmm. probably even some exchanges happening monetarily. So right. uh, for those relationships, but right at the bottom, there's a, you know, submit it directly. You know, oh, you're not one of these people. Submit it directly down here. That's the voice of Spotify, apparently. It sounds perfect. Yeah. And so every time I go, okay, here's our there XML, you here's you our stuff. It. We got you. And about a week later, I get some error about like, oh, we couldn't find the server. Not yeah. finding, but they could find the server, but you know, it was something. So I gotta, I gotta, I'll get to the bottom of it. It's eventually. a work in progress. I know Studio Demands it. A couple of our listeners as well, as well have said, Spotify. get it on Spotify. We're Which working you, on it. Yeah. That's yeah. all I can say. We're working on it. Um, oh, here's one real quick on our sidekick, Sidekicks episode, third episode from season two. I think this is pronounced Sunte91, S-U-N-T-E 91. Uh, also offered Zelda from Spirit Tracks in spirit form would be a great sidekick. I agree completely. I agree completely. We'll do, I think, let me, I want to see if I can find one iTunes here real quick. We have a right. lot of comments. So many that it's starting to get a bit much. It's great to have so much uh, interaction um, with with the listeners, getting that feedback, um, more or less. In, I'm going to jump to a Patreon thing here. Sure. sure. Um, yeah. Well, when I said a bit much, I just mean like it's it's almost overwhelming in the best way possible. Yes. And we, we do try to read as many as we can, if not almost all of them. I just build them onto this list and I push through every time. And then I guess every once in a while we'll have to do a listener feedback episode to, <laughs> to, to deal with the flow. And it's Listen. wonderful. I mean, honestly, that, that Hey Listen episode we did, it was just as fulfilling as a normal episode. It didn't feel... Oh, yeah. I, it was the conversations that came out of that was so great. Uh, two two of the bonus episodes I did for Disney Top Shelf when Jeff was unavailable was just me answering questions. Yep. And I had a lot of fun with that. It was, I'll, you know, I don't know if it was fun to listen to me talk for, I enjoyed for, it. for, that, for an hour, but... <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, over on Patreon, very recently, Adam Love sent us a message. And so I wanted to get this in right now. I think it was just a couple weeks ago as of this recording. He said, hey, you two, been listening to your podcast for a while now, figuring it was time to formally thank you for all your great work. I was listening to your Skyward Sword music episode for the second time. That was a fun one to make. Um, as I'm a big soundtrack and music lover and got inspired to dive deep into all the great music and soundtracks in the series. Can't wait for your next music episode as you two struck a nice balance by playing snippets of the songs but also adding your own in, your own insight and commentary. Great segment to continue for sure. Keep up the great work. Adam Love became a top tier member on our Patreon page and I'm so happy for his support and also uh, his message here. That's yeah. great. Yeah. We'll do another music episode. We'll try to do one every single season if not more. It's going to get, what, what might get interesting is if we ever have to do a music episode. We did Ocarina. We did mm-hmm. Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword was very, quote unquote, easy to do because it was the first Zelda game that was fully orchestrated. Yeah. They recorded a real orchestra. Mm-hmm. Usually, Zelda games, the music is, I guess you could say, I guess it's technically MIDI. Yes, yeah, MIDI. And mm-hmm. that's because they like to have the music be dynamic so that it shifts and changes if you enter a battle and stuff like that. And you can do that when the, when so the music works, is... Works the loops. Yeah, yeah, when the music is code, not a wave file or something, right. right? I just realized now, and we'll be done with our listener feedback and get our topic. I just realized that it might also be really cool to do a music episode of like the original, The Legend of Zelda. Yeah. Because I could get into what it takes to make those noises. Oh, it's like, oh, oh. Shit. Like the computer yeah. chips and the code, because those those are not recorded sound bites that are no. then manipulated. In Ocarina of Time, famously, or even Super Nintendo, it's music system, uh, you, they would load up files as samples and then you could tone pitch those files and, and change their size. And in Ocarina of Time, it's the same thing. A, a fun fact about Ocarina of Time is that the little ghosts, when they laugh, <laughs> that is the same sound file as Ganon's laugh. Roar, 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 roar. Just, just sped up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've said it on this show before. That's amazing. It, th- just going into a whole conversation of what it took to program music into Nintendo and Super Nintendo specifically. I know. Because they would be allowed, like, no space at all to yep. score an entire game. Yes. Uh, and and for how memorable those old games are, the the just the 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 uh, the overture of of Zelda, like the Legend yep. of Zelda, the. Doo- like it's so classic Indeed. and yeah that, that'd be great to to delve into in our in season one we had an episode where i did a deep dive on the making of the original the legend of zelda and there is a story that i spoke to in that episode about uh the gentleman who whose name i'm forgetting now but we talk about in the episode the composer <laughs> the composer oh koji kondo koji, yeah okay yeah yep koji kondo he's i mean I actually he's knew famous these days <laughs> well yeah i mean he's kind of a celebrity a bit you know and uh he had to come up with that. They had they were using a, a different song that was copyright uh, available or whatever, mm-hmm. some old classic song. 
And uh, in Japan, the rules are that certain songs are available to the public 50 years after their creation. Right. I know it's a little different all over the place, but that's how it works in Japan, or at least that's how it worked back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so they were using this Bolero of Fire song or Bolero of the guy, I don't remember what it was, um, as their opening for Zelda. And the team realized that that song was unavailable in its 50 year window by a matter of months. For oh my god! And they had to get the game out. For the I, hey, I'd say that's a blessing in disguise. Blessing because... in disguise. So they are to have the game come out. Even when the game comes out, it wouldn't have passed that fifty-year window. It was like right on the edge. Right. They had to come up with a different song. Koji Kondo in a night went <laughs> home and wrote the Zelda theme. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's and and the rest is history. It is that that theme song. In all of its variations that have existed over the course of the the canon, the the existence of Zelda is is one of the best video game songs of all time. I concur. Yeah, yeah I agree completely. So TC, let's get on topic. We've been we've been chatting away for almost twenty. I don't know twenty five minutes. I here. hope you don't mind, <laughs> listeners. Thank you so much. I really love doing the listener feedback in the beginning because I think it sets a nice tone for the episode. Oh, certainly. But uh, so here we are. This is going to be a little different this episode. You and I have been podcasting for a long time, so I wasn't worried about it. But usually when I have a guest on, we'll do like a top 10 or something. Mm-hmm. It's a really nice way to have a structure to move through the episode. Sure, sure. But this one's going to be a little more open-ended. Um, we, I reached out to you and I said, I really want to get you on the show. Um, I don't mind talking about the fact that you were pretty clear to me that um, probably maybe you're mostly familiar with, I would I'm saying you didn't say this to me. Thirty percent of the Zelda library. There's 25 games out there. You know. Yeah, I mean? my my Zelda knowledge. I I I can speak at length about Link and the Legend of Zelda series. Yep. Um, I uh, understand the multiple canonical timelines. Yep. I, it's so important to pop culture as a story. It's it's one of the um, segue into or tangent for a second. Yep. My uh, thesis for my English degree. I discussed modern mythology. <gasps> and Part of modern mythology, I discuss comic books, and I also discussed video games. I'm and, so excited right now. And and while you think of mythology like Thor or the Greek gods or um, uh, you know Gilgamesh, if you want to go to Mesopotamia, like there's there's the history of mythology in the world. For modern mythology, we have modern myths that will exist long after generations beyond us. Superman, right. Batman, comic yeah. books, Spider Man as themselves are a whole branch of modern mythology. But Mario, Link, uh, Sonic, there are certain video game icons that are are, are mythic. myth, are mythic. Yeah. They, are, they are legends. Yeah. They are there's an epic odyssey is no similar, no different to the to Achilles and Odysseus when you have something like Link as a character. And my so my though I haven't played a a good number of the games I have I have gone back to Ocarina of Time often. It's mm-hmm. one of my all time favorite games, as it is many uh, many people's. Yeah, um, Majora's Mask is one of I I have, I have a uh, I have loved that game. That was yeah. a game that I played because of Ocarina of Time, much like a lot of people. And I went out of my way to beat it because someone told me it was unbeatable. I showed them. <laughs> oh, you got all, so you got to the tree at the end. I beat I beat it. It's yeah. so sweet. It's that, beautiful. That the, it's about uh, loss and loneliness. Oh my and, gosh! Yeah. Again, if you, I would yeah. your whole episode on Majora. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. And I will, I'm excited because Kate um, has never played it. Oh well, she got into it, never got to the first dungeon. Yeah. And um, Kate and I have very different play styles. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the quick version is I like to explore, and Kate likes to find the the path. Uh, spans out from there, but that's the the easy version. So if you think of Majora's Mask, where the path is the puzzle. Yes. <laughs> she was years ago, and I'm speaking for her right now. She was like, I'm out. You know what I mean? So I can't wait to have that conversation with her. And she'll try to go into it with open eyes the way I am doing with I'm excited. The past I'm excited stuff. for her. I've, I've, yeah, I have so listened, I say. have listened to many, a handful, a bunch of your episodes. I don't mm-hmm. know how many of, of this show in particular I've listened to, but knowing you as well as I do, I appreciate Kate's perspective on things because I, I don't know her personally. So it's yeah. great to hear you converse with her. So I'm excited for her yeah. to experience it. Um, so I've played that. I've played, I only just recently, like in the past two months, played the original Legend of Zelda. Oh, I'm so happy you did. I, it One of my favorite things growing up with video games and having best friends over the course of my life that are huge video game fanatics, I love watching people play video games. 
I know that may seem odd. No, I get it. But but I love. I've I've experienced every Final Fantasy. <laughs> I've experienced Bioshock. Like I see. Like I I have. And and some and it's very it's very complimentary of games that you can sit and watch a game. Um, uh, I played The Wolf Among Us, the Fables yep. Telltale game. Mm-hmm. Freaking love that game. Yep, it's my top three all time favorite comic book series. Oh, wonderful! Uh, and Candace, my girlfriend, watched me play the game as well as The Walking Dead, and she was a hundred percent engaged. Yes. Um. So with with that said. I I had experienced watching the original Legend of Zelda through many of my friends playing it, I see. but I've never actually played the game until just recently. I have an emul uh, uh, an emulator, um, and I decided I was like, you know what, I'm gonna uh, more or less in the leading up to the conversation that led to us recording today. Oh, interesting! I decided to to dive into it. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Link to the Past. I remember watching people play that. Uh, uh, Breath of the Wild and um, Twilight Princess of more recent. I've sat and watched those games as well and it's i just love i love zelda as a character as a franchise i love link as a character which leads <laughs> to our conversation today indeed about link not having a voice indeed so when we you and i were going back and forth about episodes and the reason i was wanted to i i like to give our audience a little context as to where the guest is coming from yes yes of because if you don't do that they um it's easy for even myself or any listener to be like oh well what about that one moment in that one dungeon in that one game boy game it's like i'm sorry you know? i didn't play it so i don't yeah uh... and so we have these i always say to our listeners this show is a kate and i are fans mm-hmm. we're becoming mega fans but we are not experts and we are yes. learning about the games along with everyone else as we go and that's why I always feel like the listener feedback is so important because sometimes the fans, the fans of this show and also of Zelda, can continue Kate and, and our knowledge and story. Oh, you know certainly. what I mean? They, it's a, it's a, it's a give give relationship. Indeed. That's well said, well said. So we were bouncing back and forth. I thought, I thought, well, maybe we can do something about Ocarina. Maybe we can do a top ten. And then you said, well, what if we talk about the fact that Link never talks? Link has no voice. And I was like, I like this. Let's do it. Um, so now, yeah. I, now I, let's 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 dive right in here. Now I'm aware that Link has a voice. I am aware that Link has in very, very infrequently spoken in a sense where there's text blocks well, that let's, say like- Yeah, let's say it this way. I'm interrupting, I apologize, just to set to set that. Um, it Canonically, Link is, canonically in every game, Link speaks. Yes. Um, we don't we don't hear him speak mechanically in the game. There's some games where a character will will say like, "Oh, he's a quiet fellow. He mm-hmm. speaks very rarely." Mm-hmm. But he always has the his the, the the character of Link. Or and there's obviously many links through the timeline, as I know you know. Yes. Sure. But all of those links, they have the ability to speak. They're not like con- conditioned with something where they yeah, they're they not can't mute speak. or whatnot. Yeah, but yeah, there's, sure. There's no. Uh, there's no voice actor to him, right? As, as with the exception uh, of the ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Fun fact: in Ocarina of Time, the Japanese voice actor is different than the American voice actor. Really? Yeah. Why do they need that for a? Ha? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, so by what I want to say is, I think the maybe the elephant in the room, but I think what everybody knows is, of course, Nintendo makes this choice so that Link can be an avatar for the person playing. Yes, it's the it's the immersion yeah. of, and that's that's very typical of a lot of uh, RPGs mm-hmm. and adventure games where where you are the main character. I mean, the very first thing you do when you start a game, a Zelda game. Is name the character. Yeah, and usually it's your name. And it's usually your name. These days I always put in Link. I just I, cannot. Oh, I, I, I feel more comfortable making it Link as well. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, Link is, is you know, he's the hero here. I know. Um, and, and I want to say one more thing to, to, set our, uh, to set our path here. There's kind of three ways that I've observed that Nintendo um, expresses Link's voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some games where... the like there, there's some games. I think it might be even in Skyward Sword, or perhaps it's Wind Waker, where a character will ask a question of Link, and then it's implied that he tells this story, yes. and it fades to black and comes back up. Yes. Um, there's another way in Breath of the Wild. It's most obvious where Link is. You have options of dialogue for Link to say. Mm-hmm. We don't hear him say any of those things. It might even fade to black and come back up. That kind of thing. But you so select it. But yeah. you select what he's saying. And then what's the other one? Oh, just nothing. Like yeah. kind of ocarina is essentially you're just saying yes or no sometimes, and it might be a nod or a no, and yeah. that's about it. So or, those are like the three ways I think that it's expressed. And that that as a a methodology for a character is very fascinating to me. Link Link is as iconic of a video game character 
as Mario. I think, yeah. I think that Mario is more, uh, this is the best way to say this, that um, I think Link's a more beloved character than Mario. Yes. And I think that comes, a part of that comes from the fact that Mario He's a me, a Mario. He talks, and he, you. Wow, you're you, right. I think that the fact that he has a voice, that you can do an impression of oh Mario, that you you can hear Mario, like in your head. Yeah. We can. I could just did it right now. You that the fact that Mario speaks, the fact that he's existed in film, the fact that he's existed in cartoons, oh the goodness. fact that he, you can buy toys that talk of Mario, makes him much more known. I, people know Mario. Uh, I want to. I want to say that uh, the most. There was a study a couple years ago done on, um, I guess, mascots and branding. Yeah. It was, I was reading some branding blog, uh, website, whatever, and you know, Mickey Mouse is the most recognizable character around the globe. The second most recognizable character is Mario, and that does not surprise me at all. And 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 I think that that makes Mario more famous, mm. uh, more iconic, of a. A, a video game character of a modern myth, a modern yeah. mythological wow. creature that will exist far beyond the scope of his creation. That, that Mario having a voice makes him much more known. Your your mom's going to know Mario, mm -hmm. whether she's ever played a Mario game or not. So your grandma might know Mario. Yeah, like, and I think that's a that's very telling because Mario has a voice. Yeah, I think Link is more beloved as a character but less known to a non-video game player. I love this. I completely Be agree. Because he doesn't have a voice. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I, and he has had a voice in the past. Which, oh, God, uh, are you going to bring it up? <laughs> I'm going to bring it up. So, Let's do it. So uh, the um, there was a, a, the Super Mario Animation Hour. Yeah. Had, had an, a, a, a link. We're going to do... We're doing an episode on this series. Oh, my gosh. I almost thought this would be what we had to discuss, but here we go. <laughs> there it is, and he is, there it is that voice. That excuse. It's it's a very one off thing. It exists very. It's like that's really obscure. Right. It's we. It's best not to discuss in terms of of the uh, the legend of Link, the legend of Zelda. Yep. It's like that cartoon is. Let's not do that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think putting of putting a voice to Link is a mistake. I, I think that, and that's why I feel he's a more beloved character because we're all Link. I think it's yep. amazing that the majority of cosplayers for Link are female. Oh, interesting. I think that there is there is something special about Link being us, mm -hmm. as opposed to Mario being Mario. Right. I agree completely. Yeah. This is great. And uh, and and that, that, that way of storytelling, it's not just Link that's this way. A lot of RPGs are this way. All the Final Fantasy games tend to have silent heroes. Um, Chrono Trigger, Chrono doesn't speak. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, there's, and it's, again, it goes all the way back to what we said a, a, a bit ago was the immersion mm -hmm. of you becoming the character. You name Link yourself and right. you, or, you know, Booger if you want. And, and, <laughs> or my dude or, or my like dude, some of yeah. those memes. <laughs> and I think that makes Link very special of a character. Because think of Legend of Zelda as a whole. I'm saying this to you, David, in front of me and, and the listeners as well. You could tell me at length the story of Ganondorf. You could tell me the story at length of Zelda yeah. and her, especially how they they altered her canon to be chic, uh, to to yeah, have Karina. a superhero uh, uh, alter ego. And the, in Skyward Sword, she's actually there's another Zelda that becomes like this goddess Hylia yeah. that permeates the rest of the the rest of the timeline. We could talk at length just about those characters mm -hmm. and their their myths and their legends and their history. But Link his has a very he's he's an orphan. He's often most of the time. He's often an outsider in the the land he begins in, yep. and he sets off on his adventure to to experience the adventure and to grow as a character. And there's very little arc to him. So you, so you just said he's an orphan, and I said most of the time. And I think you actually might be more correct. In Wind Waker, he has a grandma. Mm -hmm. In A Link to the Past, he has an uncle. Yep. But he's never had direct parents yeah. in the games correct there's there's canon that i discussed in a previous episode to ocarina of his mom taking him to the forest and his dad yes, being in the alien army the, and all that. the opening of ocarina is him getting dropped off with in cook uh um in the village not in the game not in the game oh yeah i, I thought i had a, that is a canon i you, thought i had a memory of that. i'm sure you picked it up from like uh from a comic book or something oh, okay. in a nintendo power or whatever but yeah. canon is the mom drops it off she is she dies 
Um, but the opening of the game is the tree saying, Navi, go find Link. That's, Remember, she flies around. Yes, that's it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that 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 uh, exp- expands. It's so funny the, that I love that you remembered. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah. That you like it's it's become that the canon. I has, filed it in my head as something, and, and I'm I've sure played you that game multiple times. <laughs> imagine you've imagined the the shots and the scenes. You know, at least uh, generally so of some of these story points. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's kind of cool. Huh. That, that's it. It amuses me that I remembered that incorrectly, um, but not, but not incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think Link having having this this backstory of you're an outsider, you don't quite belong, you don't even really have a name until you give yourself a name, mm-hmm. and then you go off and experience the adventure where you you don't hear Link speak, you don't, I, and that makes the character all the more special to me and to to people who play him. I think he's usually introduced uh, waking up in the beginning of the game. Yes, yeah, it, almost all the time. I think. I think maybe the Oracle games, he doesn't wake up out of a bed, but Link to the Past, Ocarina. Oh, Majora's Mask is an exception. Yeah, he's walking through the woods. Walking through yeah, the woods. But for Majora's Mask is a direct sequel to Ocarina. Yeah. So it, it's that kind of is okay. That's the one of the few times where it's the same Link mm-hmm. from game to game. Mm-hmm. And um, Skyward Sword, he wakes up. Breath of the Wild, he wakes up out of the goop. I'm trying to think of... Wind Waker. Wind Waker. Wind Waker. He's taking a nap, so yes. he wakes up. And His sister wakes he's up. He's the future. Like Wind Waker takes place very late in the timeline. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Link not having a voice is important. I think that's what has made one of the reasons he's so important of a character in in video games and in modern myths. Yeah, uh, and why he's so special to people because we're all Link. We're not all Mario. Right. right? You play the Mario games and like I'm more of a Luigi myself. Yeah. yeah, I'm more of a toad. I'm more of a princess. Because like, they are, they're archetypes, and then you subscribe to an archetype. Exactly. Whereas Link, he is in a fashion, in a, in a way, he's a a blank slate that you get to prescribe, uh, prescribe yourself onto, mm-hmm. um, and you experience his adventures as him. As him. That's yeah. the key. And I I think we're going to go to break here in a second, but we'll come back, and I want to keep this conversation going. I'd like to speak to how how Nintendo, mm. how two or how Nintendo chooses to tell stories about a character and, and create such a a beloved character, um, but also trying to, th- walking the line of, does this character have narrative and and how does the, the player still feel like they have agency? Certainly. You know, sure. we can kind of get on that. Yeah. Wonderful. So we'll be back in just a little bit. I mean, what the heck? I'll throw a studio demands it ad in first, right <laughs> listen, off the bat. Listen to my voice again. <laughs> Let's do it, all right? Okay, we'll be back in about 30, about, about a minute and a half here. We'll okay. see you guys. Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode, we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. <laughs> our library of precious episodes. <laughs> You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Hey everybody, David here. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to talk to you about some of the updates we have on our Patreon page. Now, as some of you know, we do have our three tiers, the sword tier, the white sword tier, and the magical sword tier. And we've been getting some really tremendous support over on Patreon. It's it's truly amazing. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of our new rewards. So for starters, we've decided to add the wallpaper reward to our sword tier. This means that anyone who is a supporter on Patreon will get a special thank you on our website and they'll also receive the ability to download wallpapers once a month from our patreon page now i make these wallpapers myself and it's a lot of fun they come in a variation of screen sizes i also make a phone version and an ipad version i even make an apple watch version which is kind of fun next we have our white sword tier and that's staying pretty much the same what the white sword level will give you is early access to each of our episodes typically it's about a week before Um, also advertisement free versions of those episodes and i record a little patreon specific intro before each one just a touch of behind the scenes before we get into the episode
episodes. Also, of course, on the White Sword tier, we have our bonus content, which we release just little mini episodes every, oh, I don't know, every three or four normal episodes, we put a little mini episode in there. That will also be available on the private RSS link that you'll receive by becoming a White Sword member. And lastly, this is the big one. Our Magical Sword tier, Kate and I have decided to bring a camera with us into the studio, you could say, every single episode going forward after episode 17 of season two. So we just kind of set this camera up and we say a little quick intro to our Magical Sword patrons and we let them be there with us, so to speak, while we record the episode. I'm really excited about this because I've been wanting to give our Magical Sword supporters something really special, and I think this is a great way to do it. Okay, so that's it. You can go to patreon.com slash another Zelda podcast. You can also find links on our website to our Patreon page. We're so grateful for the support we've received already, and um, if you are interested in any of these rewards at all, please go check us out. All right, we are back from the break. We are back. TC. Yes. This is an absolute pleasure. Oh, I'm glad. I was so touched by how you so eloquently spoke about um, uh, Link uh, being beloved and maybe not as famous. I mean, we were. Jo- I was saying like, okay, Mickey came in as number one. Mario was number two. I can't remember. Some of the other characters, there was like Pillsbury Doughboy was in there, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I feel like Link, certainly if you were to make a video game list, he's certainly in the top 20 and might even find himself in the top 10. There's a lot of video games out there. Certainly. But of like people, uh, when Dan McCoy was on for our questions from a new Zelda fan, oh, because his situation was he had only played Ocarina and had just started Breath of the Wild. Oh, wow. Okay. So that created an interesting conversation um, because he there's so many gaps in his knowledge of the canon. And mm-hmm. that was a blast. Oh, boy. He actually asked kind of some hard questions. Oh, good. One it's was like, you. yeah, one was like, what's the, what's up the, with the sword? Is it magical? Is it not? And it, it, <laughs> I had to really take a deep dive in the canon of like how it's the same sword Mm -hmm. that's one of the few things that is the same link link this might be nice link is always with the exception of a few direct sequels link is always a new corporal being he's a new creature and they they, they just call him link most of the time zelda is also new Mm -hmm. but ganon ganon as as the spirit of demise ganon so the spirit of demise from the top permeates through all, the whole timeline and he's often uh repre- often manifested as ganon and then additionally uh manifested physically as ganondorf, ganondorf the human yes right yeah. but so that's always the same spirit or creature that's so great i love that it probably wasn't there in 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 tent at the beginning it was probably just like it's another zelda game but then the fans started creating this Head cannon mm-hmm. that they okay well which timeline is this on how do we link this all together I love yeah. that they decided to use Ganon as the the reoccurring villain to reincarnations of Zelda and reincarnations of Link and that's that's really fascinating to there me. was a lot of retconning when, when yes. Skyward Sword came out but when the timeline the first time the timeline ever hit anybody's brain at all technically was a link to the past which was only the third game right and I'll I'll say why very quickly here the first game came out fine. Uh, people liked it. Uh, the second game came out, and I believe that that game is a direct sequel, and that is also the same Link. Okay. In fact, it's it's always really fun to talk about how the original map from Zelda 1, I guess we will jokingly say, is technically represented tile for tile in, it, in the Zelda 2 art style in Zelda 2. Yeah. So Zelda 2 is... The same expanded, case. yeah, same, same world, same yeah. world, exactly, and I think it's even the same Zelda. So then, when a link to the past comes out, they called it a link to the past because it was a prequel to the two, and it's time travel, right? and it has its own time travel, so yeah. that's fun. But it actually takes place before the two, even when they only had those three games. They're mm-hmm. like, "Hey guys, this is a prequel." <laughs> then people are like, "Oh." There's a timeline. Well, but I think people didn't care as much. There wasn't really the internet as much mm-hmm. yet. Thanks, the internet. Yeah. And then Ocarina <laughs> came and people assumed that it was a little bit of a retelling of maybe the first Legend of Zelda, but it was its own thing. Mm-hmm. They assumed it was just later on down the line. And then the next time that... And then Majora's Mask was a direct sequel. Yep. But the first time that um, a larger timeline was expressed, directly expressed was in Wind Waker. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, did you just give me a W? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Wind Waker, when you go down under the ocean and old Hyrule is under the ocean and that is the Hyrule from Ocarina. Yes. And the game does not shy away from that by showing characters from Ocarina in the stained glass windows. Mm-hmm. And so that's when Nintendo like started like really clicking the gears there. That and ex- now this expanded universe yeah. in a sense. So the only two characters that really follow through the timeline, sans it splitting into three things, we'll just call it the timeline, Yeah. Um, is... 
is is demise usually Ganondorf and the Master Sword. Mm-hmm. So Zelda and Link just come up. So, but I'm getting us a little bit off. But I'm trying to what I'm trying to circle around what I'm spiraling around here is I think it is a logistical intent that Link is new each game. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm going with this. I'm, and and to to not give him a voice. It, it, yeah. And you just described all this this depth and this history and it's and it's it's incredible to me the voices that we do get. Ganon has a voice demise. Yeah. As, as, yeah. Uh, we can call him Ganon. It's yeah. fine. Um, Zelda has a voice. Yeah. Uh, De- even- De- demise is almost like the Darth Plagueis or yeah. Plagueis, <laughs> where it's like, oh, it's this Darth guy that started it all, but, but we don't know anything. Wise. We don't know much about him, but yeah. he's p- apparently part of Emperor, <laughs> not, not part of Snoke. Like we can call him Ganon. It's fine. Uh, the that Link's silence uh, is what lets uh, Link not having a voice allows the game to become, like I said, more beloved or whatnot. I think the so, some of the true voice of the series is the music. We were discussing the score earlier. Ooh. That so much of the voice of the the temples, the voice of the villages of the of the land that you explore, is embodied through the score and the MIDI score being looped. Versus the beautiful composition of the later the latter games, so the more recent ones, mm-hmm. um, that the uh, a lot of what puts voice to the game is the music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I know that the ocarina has existed as an instrument through more than one game, but yeah, but the music of it, it's ocarina, not like a master sword thing though. No, where no, it's no, going just through. just yeah. it's it. I know the ocarina is in I think Link to the Past, but it's, there is an ocarina. The the game Ocarina of Time itself is. All those songs are yeah. are moods and characters to themselves, and I think that's that's telling of the score in general across all the games. Well, and if I can rewind back to the development of the first game, of course they couldn't have uh, audio files of people talking. Yeah, and the music, the g- 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 whatever it was, even if it's just programmed in, that was the only way to have a figurative voice at all. Mm-hmm. And I think even that piggybacks off what you're saying. Uh, you had you had mentioned on the break here something to, for us to dive into oh. is how does Nintendo work with this this idea of oh, a yeah. voiceless character and and that's that is a credit to them. Because let's you know keep using Mario as a character um, because Mario has a voice. You could look like Sonic doesn't have a voice in game but he's he's gone right. on to have multiple cartoons he's he probably has a it probably actually if i may mm-hmm. he kind of does in that i think around the time that mario started talking the 3d games sonic kind of started talking yeah. that's when you get the all oh, right that's right come here on we go. down yeah yeah so they might have similar trajectories they're mm-hmm. kind of parallels yeah um but it's often been said and miyamoto has said this that he felt that the mario game original mario brothers original legend of zelda and and continued on are kind of two sides of the same coin they're equal inspirations but they also represent opposite experiences oh certainly the the side scroller Mm -hmm. fun party style of of mario right um mario's story is jump to the next thing for the most part left to right onto the next level and that's okay have some fun and i i love it and with zelda they literally took the jump button away yes and (laughs) it's top down it's not left to right in in a linear when they were were making the original two they chose that top down even though they were originally going to maybe do a side scroller like dungeon thing there there are a couple if i'm remembering correctly there are a couple moments with the side scroller yeah they play around with some side scrolling and uh, but they want to top down because th- that was the closest they could get to representing a f- basically 3D environment. The not having a voice to not develop Link as a as a singular character that you he's not s- a solid snake. He's not. Right. He's not. Um, uh, even Mario has a bit of a story to him. Yeah. Um, the the fact that Link doesn't have much of a history and a voice allows the the games to exist for the players but also allows the games to exist for the adventure and the right. gameplay it's not about link's story it's about the immersion in th- this temple let's talk about the water temple let's you couldn't have a show about zelda like you're having if zelda's story was clearer i think if, yeah, I, agree. I i think the fact that you can say let's do an entire episode on just uh the desert right um I don't feel like you could do that with something like Mario or or Metal Gear or uh, you know the Final Fantasy games. Yeah, you, maybe, maybe Final Fantasy was some of that lore. But like, if you just to keep it to the Mario thing, you could 
I'm sure there's Mario podcasts out there. I'm, there oh, sure, are. sure, sure, yeah. But I guess if I were producing any Mario podcast, I would have to pivot more towards maybe development and reviews. Yeah. And more the story then becomes the making of these games or which game comes out next. I think, you know, that might be more the case. I don't know if you could do like... Let's just do an episode <sighs> discussing plants like oh oh, perfect perfect yeah Yeah. maybe you could do a actually maybe there's a podcast idea out there where people literally play every mario level and review the level that could be something that's cool but i digress you yeah the way we will have an episode of eight favorite items or eight favorite weird items yeah you couldn't do that with it's the magic of yeah you couldn't do that with with with, favorite plants yeah maybe favorite i mean mario does have items maybe we're getting a little wrapped around here but i I shouldn't say you couldn't have a mario podcast like your zelda podcast but there's a magic in the zelda universe and link the the fact that the game is not called the adventures of link the the the, the fact that it's the legend of zelda only one of them is called the yeah, adventure that's of link. it that's it that's just one uh-huh. <laughs> is 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 incredible to me that they've been able to create this iconic game series where your main character isn't even the title character i mean you're yeah. right and it's you're right yeah it's it that is pr- that's a that's a rarity because even going a, a more adjacent to literal RPGs like Final Fantasy, the Final Fantasy games aren't built upon the characters. The games exist in singular states as a ch- as it's this Final Fantasy game. That's it. There's no crossover overlap. I know there is. I'm not saying there isn't, but it, right, for, for the, the most for part. the most part. Um, whereas Zelda, the Legend of Zelda, existing in 25 games, mm-hmm. and what is the overlap? What isn't? It's it it feels in in a similar realm of adventure of fantasy of magic of something like Doctor Who where Doctor oh, Who oh interesting where where Doctor Who has a fifty year canon of thirteen doc fourteen if you count the War Doctor like yeah uh, and if I you do kn- count the War Doctor I'm fine yeah. with it if you know it all you have a completely different experience than I'm just going to watch David Tennant, mm-hmm. but I'm still going to, I can still love. So like with Zelda, if you just like me have just played yeah. one, two or one or two of the games, I can love those games. I can love the character and the adventure that I went on is a completely different experience than someone who's played all 25. Mm-hmm. And when thinking about the games I've had played, when thinking about someone who's played the 25 games, they're not going to talk about Link. They're not gonna. I don't feel like people are gonna be. Right. This is the best adventure of Link. This is this is Link's best story. When uh, Kate and I were talking about building this, uh, the many conversations. It was a bit like you and Jim, where you were having conversations, and all of a sudden it clicked. Like, oh, this should be a, a show. Yeah. Kate and I had that because um, we were talking about Breath of the Wild and Ocarina and all these things. But before that, even Kate had just recently, I guess, purchased Breath of the Wild, mm-hmm. and I had only bought it maybe six months before her. We both got the game two years or so after it came out and for me i was kind of holding off i was like oh get it on a switch get it on a switch and finally i was like i can't wait and i got it <laughs> and i read reviews that the wii u version is essentially the same it's like half the resolution and some of the draw distance is a little less but i'm fine right um and it's even it's not even the draw distance it's technically where the textures anti-alias is a little closer where the switch one can process a little further <laughs> gotcha i'll deal with it um um and we i was we were talking about um like zora's domain in breath of the wild and i'm, I'm guessing maybe you've tinkered with breath of the wild yes yeah, 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 yeah okay yeah. um and the idea that in even in ocarina and and, and hold on to my second point that i'm going to make here because the first point you might be like what um in ocarina you go to Zora's domain and you execute task one, two, three, and four, and then you can get into Jabu Jabu or whatever. Mm-hmm. You get into the fish or you get into the ice, you know, whatever. When you go to Zora's domain, and so oftentimes when you talk to people about Ocarina, you say, oh, what did you think of Zora's domain? How, what did you think of going through Zora's domain? Mm-hmm. But when you go to Zora's domain in Breath of the Wild, you say, how did you go through Zoro's domain? <laughs> yeah. What you know, because you can approach from any angle. You can talk to people or not. And like, oh, what did you do it's there? A choose your own adventure. There. It's, yeah, it yeah. really is. Every single second in Breath of the Wild is choose your own adventure, and the adventures are just there to be had. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from Ocarina because the point I'm trying to make is the original Legend of Zelda, and I would still argue Ocarina. Um, Ocarina for its time was pretty dang open world. Mm-hmm. An actual open world game wasn't existing in the way that we understand them today. Right. So wasn't I would a sandbox. Still, yeah, I would argue that for its time, it was considered very close to being an open world game before we had that expression. There were some 2D 
you know, uh, not roguelikes, but 2D random generated sure, terrain sure. things that were, you know, maybe arguably bigger. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, you see where I'm going with this. So I think even around the times of Ocarina, but the, what permeates all of the Legend of Zelda, and I think it's expressed most in the dungeons, is you usually will say, like in a Mario game, you might say, did you get past World 8? Right. But in in a Zelda game, most of the time you can say, like, how did you do the water dungeon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it might technically be checkpoint to checkpoint or key to key to key, but mm-hmm. the best dungeons are the ones where maybe you get a couple keys before you know what to do with them. Like, uh, and then raise the water level, but then you got to lower the... Yeah, right. And I honestly think that IG Numa's what he brought to the franchise, just as a quick side note, was the... He brought in some of that non-linearity, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but again, again, I think that can be brought back to the Link situation. So Link being a new character, he's usually a touch reluctant. Mm-hmm. He's not a snot. He's only a snot in Wind Waker a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yep, but in yep. all the rest, he's a, he's a pretty, pretty cool dude. Um, well, actually, Wind Waker no. was set up for failure to begin with because it was fouling off of, I mean, that's why Majora's Mask was also considered a failure. Because when you have one of the best video games of all time, Ocarina. anything that's going to trickle after that. And Wind Waker was on GameCube. like and it, it was, And it got rushed out. And it, it was too many problems to, be, to begin with. So Link being snotty, I think, was just made all the worse by the fact that people already went in ready to not like the game. Yeah, I think there was also a cultural thing going on at the time where we all, I always joke about this, where like that was the time where even Sonic, a lot of the characters were becoming like cool dudes with an attitude. Yeah. There was a little bit of that around <laughs> that cross, time. cross, eyebrow cocked. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, honestly, at the same time for Mario Sunshine, even though in the game he wasn't represented the way I'm about to say, but the cover art, he literally had his sleeves rolled up, yep. his back turned, and he was looking Pshaw. at you with a frown. I'm cool. <laughs> right. He was like unhappy. Or maybe he's facing one of the art, one of the artworks he's backwards. Maybe yeah. the American one, but he's still like, he's mad. Yeah. Mario's mad in so Mario I, Sunshine. I, I tangented it away he's from serious. Your, your point there. You were talking about, um, uh, Link is oh, bring it to Link. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you. Pardon me. Um, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it's not Link's story; it's your story. Yes. And I know we've been saying it's not Link; it's you all so much. But that's the idea: is when you, when you speak about Link, and what his story is through the game, it's it's whatever the character chooses for him to it's, do. And it's and it's small. The, I the, think the Link's Link's story, his backstory, and what happens to him in a, in an adventure game like this is not as important as what were the dungeons like let me tell you about let me zelda's such a, a people love zelda as a, especially because of ocarina empowering her to be essentially a masked vigilante i feel like she you mean chic uh, yeah becoming yeah. chic yeah oh right, right, right. I'm that, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. zelda became chic and yeah. now she has like the fact that they are two different playable characters in uh smash in smash brothers upset some people is like why would they do that yeah um it, I mean, I I'm, I process that just as a side note because I'm like, well, they have all the different links in there. Yeah. We'll, we'll go. With it. <laughs> so to to look at Nintendo creating this this character and this franchise around such a, a character with so I, I don't want to I'm not saying as belittlingly, but such a, a small amount of information. Right. Link exists in in a, a gigantic story mm-hmm. with with so little detail. We why I I I know why why do you think that the cartoon didn't work. It, okay. it exists as such a small number of episodes. It, we like to forget it. I, I know I have my theories of why, yeah. but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why <clears throat> Why did the cartoon fail? Why is that such a, a, a benchmark to go, hey, don't do that? <laughs> yeah, and to say fail, I'll, I'll choose to interpret that as in, we're not talking about if the show was a failure or a success. We're talking about people's emotional reaction to yes, it failed. Yes, yes, yes. Or, or at least fails now. Maybe when I was, I think I, think I remember being, eight years old and, and like waiting to catch an episode and thinking it was the coolest thing in the world. And I don't even remember Link having an annoying voice as a kid because I don't think you're just not on kids, that register. Kids don't have the, when you're younger, you don't have the distinguishing palette or a cynicism. Yes. Because yes. like I'll talk to someone and be like, hey, what's the movie that inspired you? Oh man, the movie that inspired me to become a filmmaker was Ready Player One. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, good. No, no, I, you know, I, I, I actually that example happened recently, and if he happens to listen to this episode, I'm not diminishing his love for that film. I'm just using that as an example of someone who's in their 30s going, "What? It just I came mean, out. And- Back to the Future, Star Wars. Like, right. no, no, Ready Player. Like, yep. okay, fine, <laughs> let it be, let it be. Well, and if that person's younger, then that is there. Like for me, I sometimes say, you know, people a little older than me, they usually say like, oh, the Star Wars was the thing that made yeah, them want yeah. to be a filmmaker. Yeah. For me, it was Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park hit me when I was like 13 years old. Yeah. It was exactly the same time I was considering film, considering, you know, the computer animation, all of that. So for me, that was the trigger. Jim, and, Jim's yeah. is the mummy. 
The Nin- Mummy, Brand- Brendan Fraser, Brendan the Mummy. Fraser, the Mummy. So be it. Yeah. So yeah. be it. That that came out just a month or two before Episode One, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, so so all of those are valid, but I hear you. Yeah. Absolutely. And like the the sweetest thing happened to me a few weeks ago, and I think I Instagrammed this or tweeted it or something. But my I was showing. You know, there's a lot of confusing emotions about Episode Seven, Eight, and Nine right now for Star Wars. Certainly. I'm I'm a fan. It's a whole different conversation, yep. but I'm I am a fan as well. <laughs> in general, I love to love things. Exactly. As, as, as I don't uh, others hate. have said. I don't want to hate. Who said that? Uh, I, Jeff Kanata said it like okay, a decade yeah. ago. I don't know. <laughs> I love to love in some other podcast, but it's it's a really nice expression. I love to love things, so I go into things trying to, uh, for the most part, be like let's let's go for the good things. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, so I'm neutral on this episode nine thing. However, I don't want to date this episode too much. But my niece looked at the episode. It's my seven year old niece. And I don't have too many filmmaking, quote unquote, conversations with her. Right. She sometimes asks about the production stuff that I do or even that stuff that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's seen a few things that you and I have both acted in together. So I think she's like contextually aware of, of this stuff. Um, we did have a conversation real quick about Star Wars where she was t- she was discussing with me how when a character dies, they're pretending. Right. And like what she understands what acting is. Right. She knows that. Obi-Wan Kenobi is an actor named Ewan McGregor portraying Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Obi-Wan Kenobi is a story. You know what I mean? She, they saw that. Okay, right, cool. Right, She's not, where did he go? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and she, she always, she, oftentimes now, I'm getting a little off track here, but oftentimes she asks me after we watch a Star Wars movie, she wants to go to IMDb and see the actor. Oh, okay. She wants to see what they look like in real life, so to speak. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, we watched the episode nine trailer, and when it got done, like so quiet, and people know my seven-year-old niece, Quinn, because they've heard her on an episode in this show, She's the artist one. You know, yeah. my other niece is, is excelling in other wonderful, beautiful ways. Um, she all she she kind of muttered. She said, I want to grow up and make a Star Wars movie. Whoa. From the so episode that might be, trailer. Wow. That might be the I know. You just, I was so touched. Yeah. And so as much as we can, as much as people can push their glasses up and get their get their pants in a ruffle about <laughs> if they liked episode eight or not, like it's, that's you know, the moment that matters. Yeah. I I love to love things. It's great. I'm gonna use that. Um I don't go into things to hate them. Uh, I don't it, it is a matter of, hey, you're not the audience for this. Just chill. If you don't like it, fine. You don't like it. You don't have to make yeah. a whole like spiel about it. So I'll look back at the Zelda, the Adventures of Zelda oh, right. cartoon series. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. We we didn't have a distinguishing palette at the time. We were probably just excited to see a video game cartoon of someone we were familiar with. And I would say that at the time, all of culture was probably excited just yeah. to see a video game cartoon. I mean, this is was this was in the late eighties, yeah, yeah. late eighties when there was like the Zelda serial. Um, Nintendo didn't have a larger marketing branding plan. Many companies didn't back right. then. This this kind of they, macro branding that's happening in the last decade or two is a completely different culture right um so basically back then i mean that was this is also around the time that like he managed you know kids cartoons were yeah. the commercials oh yes certainly but you know i've watched enough documentaries on hulu and netflix now of these like toy documentaries that are wonderful the toys that made us the and toys all those that made things. us love great, it great show and so often it's um it's well what comes with the toy well we're gonna have a 12 episode series <laughs> that we're gonna this. outsource to some animation yeah. company they're gonna make it <laughs> on a dime and we just got to get it on the TV. And I feel that, um, in many ways, there's probably a marketing, I'm, 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 uh, I am building this headcanon for myself of reality that there was a, enough of a marketing team that said, Oh, well, we got to get one of those Zelda. We got to get a Zelda cartoon. Come out on. There. Now to be fair, it's animated pretty well. It's hand-drawn animation. Yes. It's cell animation. It has a good look to it. Compared it's, to the kind where where it's like just the mouth is moving or right, something. Or Hanna-Barbera, which is some of the laziest animation you can you can get for hand-drawn looping animation. Stuff, right? yeah. So to be, to be fair to the show, it's animated well for its era. Um, but it's giving Link the voice that they the choice to do that. Yeah. This goes to a bigger picture as a whole when you think of silent protagonists. It's using that term for a character like Link who rarely actually actually speaks is certainly what we're discussing here. Mm-hmm. But in in that aspect of not having a voice to a character who is beloved and then failing at giving him a voice, like on the cartoon, sure. goes to a, a broad spectrum of of a voiceless character that is beloved. Yeah. Harry Potter had yeah. a voice in our heads oh. until Daniel Radcliffe gave him an actual voice yeah. until uh, Emma Watson became Hermione Granger. Hermione sounded a certain way in all of our heads. Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson will never 
uh, ever release Calvin Hobbes to anything besides the printed page in comic book form. There will never be t-shirts signed off by him. There will never be an animated series or films or anything. You'll never get some lazy ass DreamWorks Calvin and Hobbes 3D movie because Bill Watterson will never do that because yeah. he knows Calvin has a voice for all of us. And, and, and until you give him a specific voice, he will have every voice. He will have our voice. So when you look at the Zelda cartoon, yes, coming off of that, when you look at the Zelda cartoon, the it's actually canonically pretty dang accurate. Mm -hmm. All of the bad guys are actually represented fairly correctly. Right. The castle, the dungeons, like a lot of that stuff, with the exception of I think Link kind of quote unquote lives in the castle because they probably just whatever. But the truth is, like the enemy, it's not it's not a knockoff where. Um, even arguably some of those Super Mario Brother cartoons got a little off canon where all of a sudden they're in, you know, lands that don't exist and right, stuff like that. Right. Um, so it's actually, uh, oddly, the attention to detail for the time, certainly compared mm -hmm. to maybe like even a G.I. Joe uh, cartoon, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. it's respectable. I think that, that, that at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's that Link has a voice that, it's, uh, it, retroactively speaking, none of us want. It It's, yes, exactly. It's... When, when a character has never had a voice, or has had a voice in some uh, rare example, not uh, like oh, okay, well, yeah, it's been animated before, it's been this before. If you get it right across the board, you're going to have fans go, "Correct, I now accept that this is the voice. I accept yeah. that Elijah Wood is Frodo Baggins. Right. I accept that Ian McKellen is Gandalf the Grey. Yeah. Even so, let's let's do Harry Potter. We yeah. accept Daniel Radcliffe as Harry Potter because they they did wisely finally choose to go with someone with an accent and not like making an American kid or something, Certainly, which was yeah. on the table for a while. Right. You yeah, know what with, I mean? When Spielberg was uh, wanted to get involved and, yeah. and cast Haley Joe Osmond, and like, God, can you imagine that universe? <laughs> I do not want to live in that universe. We uh, <laughs> we accept it because it's close enough to what we were surmising. Yeah. If 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 enough fans say correct, yeah. Even if it's not a hundred percent accurate to the source material, even if it's not what everyone truly wanted, you will have people say, "Yes, that is the voice of that character." Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, to stick with Harry Potter, since yeah. we're in the fantasy realm, there is a divide in fans. Uh, there is the fans of the books who who love the characters, who love the series, who actually don't accept a lot of the choices they've made in the films, particularly. Michael Gambone, for my money, is the worst Dumbledore we could possibly have had. He yeah. is the wrong voice, the wrong performance, and I blame him. I blame the director. I blame the writers. I bl blame J.K. Rowling for allowing it to happen. Yeah, and um, I know I, I'm, I know I'm not alone in that. I was I I I processed him watching those films. Yeah, I was okay with it. Yeah. Um, I do, th yeah, I, I agree. And when you do go back, the only thing that's so wonderful about those first two, because the, 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 there are many things about those first two that that I uh, um, am less enchanted with. Yeah. But man, what is it, Richard Harris? Richard right? Harris. Oh, he's he, perfect. He's perfection. I know. And it was and, like exactly what we were looking for. And that's when when something exists like Link never having a voice. Mm. If they decided, and we'll we'll discuss this on. Our episode of my sh of our show of I was going to close Amazing. out with this. Yeah, we still we've got a good 10, 15 minutes yeah. left of this uh, one. But we will have to discuss that angle of things. So please, you know, those listening, if you want to hear us continue to discuss giving voice to Link, giving voice to this franchise, making definitive decisions, mm -hmm. we're asking a lot of the fans to accept. Yes, and I'm and it is smart of Nintendo to not want to do that. You have an essence with his hya hya hyas. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and his ooh -oohs or whatever they are, <laughs> but and it's just enough for us to give a a a, a, a spectrum of yeah. uh, a, a direction of tone. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, let's talk about it right now, just for a minute. It's true. I've spoke about it at the beginning of this episode, but full disclosure: as soon as you and I are done recording this episode, we're gonna f flip seats, yep. and I'm gonna be a guest on your show, wherein we will, as your show does, uh, we will we will ha say that a studio has pitched that. A Zelda movie must be made. Must be made, yeah. Must be made. We're going to try to figure out how to do it because I f feel, and I've said this on this show before, so I don't think it's a spoiler, I think it would be a terrible idea to make a Zelda movie. And we're going to see if we can crack that nut. Yeah. Um, um, with that said, let's let's spend the re some of the time in this episode uh, trying to speak to some of the devices or the techniques that Nintendo then uses 
to to walk that line and give Link character, mm-hmm. but without giving him words. Some of it is done by mechanically giving him words in Breath of the Wild by having you be able to say certain things. Right. But Link, ooh, ooh. Okay. Technically, I believe this is correct. Technically, Link never speaks separate from the player's agency or will. Right. You get to select what I, he says. Yeah. Even if and the closest it ever gets is you say a yes or a no. Mm-hmm. Or or maybe, you know, it's obviously it's obvious that in some of the replies in Ocarina, it's like there's only one reply, but they pretend there's an option. Mm-hmm. But you're like or once in a while they'll get a little cheeky with it in some uh, maybe over in like Skyward Sword, they'll get a little cheeky where you can say two things, but it's gonna go to the same path. Right. It's yes and yes, dummy. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but it's gonna keep going. Um so that's one of the ways they get around it in that he has a voice that way, but at the same time, that's still the player's voice. It's still a player's voice. The 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 way that Nintendo has crafted these games to give the players enough information to understand where Link is starting is, especially the newer games, I'd say probably uh, Ocarina and on, yeah. there's a prologue that yeah. sets up the universe and sets up Link where he's at. You had mentioned earlier, he always wakes up. Yeah. Um, that's not in the original game. You just start in the middle of Hyrule, ready to. Oh, there's a cave in front of me. Oh, I get a sword. Yep. Like, um, <laughs> but so happy you said that. <laughs> I had a whole thing about that in our making of the original episode. Yeah. <laughs> it's we can talk video game programming dynamics. Mario versus Zelda. How like everything you need to know is right there on the first screen. That's a. I'm tangenting off that, but like. I love it. If if they made Mario now, it'd be like you'd get like three seconds to the right, and it'd be like, "Hey, uh, subscribe to us on Facebook and share with your friends." <laughs> oh God, that would be the worst. <laughs> I mean, right now, as bad as it gets, it's not it's not too bad, but it's like you run forward, and then a little figure that says like "push A," and then push like, it. "Did so, you know you could push B to jump?" <laughs> yeah, I, shut up. <laughs> um, but the prologues give uh, is is a, a way that Nintendo has crafted the enough information about who this link is for this game uh, that you can then proceed with that little bit of information. TC, I just realized something. Most of the time, those prologues actually are setting up the story. The villain. And then go to Link. Yes. They very be- rarely show Link in that prologue doing anything. Correct. They'll, they will set up the world. Yeah. They will set up Zelda. They will set up the villain. Um and and then bring you to the village where Link starts to bring and, yeah, and for the most part yeah. for the most part will fly you into to his world with very little information but enough information for you to understand this is this is where I am this is where I'm starting and then it's those initial interactions in whatever village you start in mm-hmm. that will give you some information about hey outsider mm-hmm. hey you weird kid right yeah I just thought of something interesting the two Oracle games for the Game Boy Color do have link in the prologue and they don't have the hey outsider narrative oh. which is interesting but um but i guess the mystery of link happens in the prologue then i'm not saying that it goes against what we're saying mm. but that is that is just that is one exception but that one you still feel like you're obviously controlling him but as i process this in my head as i'm thinking out loud right now i when you play the two Oracle games, and they're wonderful, wonderful games, there is a minute or two where you're you're transcending or transitioning into like, oh, this was a person with a life, and he was already doing something. He was already riding his horse, and he walks into this frame, right? And now I can control him. It takes a couple screens for you to feel like you are him, right? You know, whereas if Link wakes up out of the bed, it's like, of course, you are him right now. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's, it will consider also the mechanics of how many, uh, but you know. Hmm. How few of the Zelda games are first person? Well, none of them are. None of them are. In fact, just in our episode just before this, which only came out days ago as of our recording of this, um, when they were developing Ocarina of Time, Miyamoto, very early in, in the development, said, well, what if we do first person? It might be really immersive. We've never been able to do it before. And they ended up not going with it because you couldn't see Link, mm-hmm. which was interesting. Because one might deduce that going first person... Uh, continues the the agency of the player makes them really feel like they're there but they found it was significantly more interesting to see the avatar because link may not have a voice but he has one of the most iconic looks yeah that's that's why you see so many people cosplay with the multiple colored costumes why why it's it there is something wonderful about and this may go as simple to the fact of mario super mario fire mario star mario like mm-hmm. that's the original game yeah um and link has 
his classic green and yeah. yellow outfits, but then you have blue for water temple and red for right. for fire temple and um, the the very uh, shadow link and whatnot. There's something uh, I can't. I mean, there's not something. There, the look of Zelda of the game. Sorry, Woo! did you just say yeah. Zelda for Link? No, 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 I would never do that. <laughs> I am now kicked off the podcast. No. For, it's been swell, TC. Uh, yeah. Oh god, the the look of Link is yeah. is so important, and I think it's critical that he is. It's a third person game that yeah. you you. I wouldn't want to play. I don't. Well, what's want... your most memorable character from Call of Duty? What that you played as? <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, but yeah, like, right. And I just thought about this. You know, okay, first person find like. Sky, well, what's your what's your, that iconic character from Skyrim that you played as? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can technically I think do third person in Skyrim, so that's a little bit but the less default, strong. The default is, is is first person. Yeah, or Fallout. I mean, I know they have the characters, but the I want to say one more thing about that. Then when Rare was making a first person Metroid game, because you know it's Mario and Zelda are two sides of the same coin, but I think many people agree that the triangle of very reckon. I mean, I guess Pokemon's kind of in there now, but it's a little bit adjacent. Because it's its own thing. Yeah. Oh, is, you're going OG Nintendo. Yeah, OG is Mario, uh, Mario, Zelda, and Metroid. So certainly, Samus. You know? Yeah, yeah. So well, yeah. So Mario, Link, and Samus. <laughs> I mean, how shocked were people when Sam when Samus ended up being a girl <laughs> in that first game? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you beat it, and her suit comes off, and she's in a bikini. It's like, yeah. huh. Yeah, what? it was oddly, <laughs> it, that, you know, that is that is like the the weird, like even even in the lens of our times now, that is such an uh, uh, odd thing because it's that it's that very touchy line of, oh, it's empowered, but we're what? What? sexualizing her. She's I'm, in a bikini. I'm so confused. And yeah. you know what? Me baffing calling Zelda Link Link Zelda. Yeah, it's fine. Is, Don't worry about uh, it. I know. Well, actually, it's it a slip of the tongue. It's it's a slip of a tongue, but it's worth discussing that in the famous versus beloved. That oh. there are there are plenty of people who make the assumption that Legend of Zelda, Kid in the Green, like yeah. you associate the look of Link with mm-hmm. the title of the game, and people are, can only go so far with that. Mm-hmm. Whereas truly true fans, the, the the beloved nature of the character, know mm-hmm. Link is the hero, Zelda is the the princess. Uh, a hero unto herself. It's the Legend of Zelda that you then enact each time. You you are you are moving through that legend um and when retro was making first person samus Mm -hmm. for the gamecube um they were really adamant about having the hud be literally the inside of her helmet right and that you see it all and so much so that when lighting is just right in that game perhaps you recall you see her face you can see her eyes yeah her eyes her face her whole thing yeah besides also seeing her in the cutscenes, you you when you play Metroid, okay, you definitely it's definitely the Avatar thing. It's mm-hmm. not oh I'm in this game. It is still I'm playing as Samus, even though it's first person. That's the first maybe like Halo Four did this. I never played Halo Four, but it's one of the fun, one of the games that I can recall that's first person where you still feel the Avatar thing. Yeah. It's because they have to show some of it. I mean, have to they chose to show some mm-hmm. of it. Well, that's the the artistic choice to keep uh, Link third person. The the yeah. that is. Amazing to me that that uh, uh, why what is the video game philosophy behind that to make the decision of not having main characters in Call of Duty to to give Master Chief a, a voice and a presence in the cutscenes but you play him first person so you are Master Chief uh, there's that uh, decision in the video game making process is is interesting to me because yeah. it's not just hey I got a great idea for a video game well now you have to discuss. What mechanic are you going to use for the the play? How, what's the immersion angle of this? Right. In Fallout, you are in the apocalypse. Right. It's you. Um, but when you play Legend of Zelda, you are playing Link, and there's a, a slight disconnect there. That's a. I, I don't really have a, a broader point to that. It's no, just it's okay. a, a fascinating uh, thing to consider. When. Let's let's have a little bit of fun here, right at the end. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to studio demands you you. Okay. Studio demands it you, but let's f- take a few minutes to explore. If <laughs> see because okay, well I was gonna say like what if a Zelda game comes out and it is critical that that link has a more narrative expressed than we expected. Okay, in other words, Skyward Sword had a little bit of this. He uh, Wind Waker a- too has has a bit more story to Link if I'm remembering. Yeah, in correctly. the beginning. Yeah, he starts reluctantly. Yeah. You know. Um, Skyward, he's in school, and then he's doing. The know, trailer for the new game looks like quite the story element as yeah, well. Yeah, it does. Yeah, Breath of the Wild Two is what it's called right yeah. now, and that could all just be prologue too. We don't know, but um, but yeah, I agree. Um, if so, what so mechanically, 
Yeah, maybe this is a horrible question. What what changes if you go first person? Is that what you're? Is no, that what I'm going, going with okay. is like if you do have to tell a story and you can't have your main character talk, how do you do it? Oh, I see. I uh, guess it's music. Yeah, uh, it's also if you have to get literal information across, l- leading responses, which they have done in several games where someone will ask a question and Link will just stand there and then they'll go, yes, you are correct, kid. This is a bottle. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so there, it's leading responses from from the, the game design angle. It's the, the programmer, the storyteller making a decision of, well, this is what he said. Yeah, I guess I am. Tr- I'm trying to ask you like mechanically as a writer, what are the, what are the tips and the, what are the tricks that Nintendo employs from your perspective or, or whatever? Well, it's, it they- is leading responses. Indeed. It is already having the... Legend of Zelda is not an RPG. It right. is not a tradi- it is not Final Fantasy where it's not a sandbox game. There is a story and you have to okay I'm check off the chapters to get to the end of the game. Yeah. Um the more sandbox something like Tw- uh Twilight Princess and um well, Breath of the Wild, uh, for, sure. Of the Wild for sure. I I feel that those games though they do expand into the sandbox are less beloved. I I sorry to keep using that word less liked than the games that have a very clear beginning, middle, and end, and how are you going to unfold dungeon after dungeon? Fascinating. The closer these these Zelda games have stuck to that original original game. Of, of Ocarina? Yeah. Uh, no, no. The original okay. Zelda 1. Because the original is like fairly open-ended. Yes. But you still have to check off the dungeons in a proper order. Well, some of them... I'm so sorry. I'm going to no, nerd no, no, you. No, not exactly the right yeah. order. You don't have to go one, two, three, four, five. It's not a level There's system. There's a few checkpoints. Yeah, but you do have to get certain things done before yes. you can advance the, the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not it's not 100% open world, right. but it's not 100% free. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, they give you all your things right in the beginning, and then you literally you do whatever you do want. do whatever you want. I, uh, Ocarina of Time. You can do certain things in a slightly yeah. different order, but you have to do certain things before you can advance to the next thing. Absolutely. And yeah, so it's Ocarina is actually pretty linear now that I think about it. Yeah. And I think the more linear the games are, that still give you some freedom to to solve the puzzles and explore the I think that those games are going to maintain the 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 love of the fans more than the more open world games. Interesting. Uh Hyrule Heroes, is that what is that the what's the um uh, well, Hyrule Warriors is Hyrule, an offshoot it. game. Yes. How many people do you, do you hear talk about that as their favorite Zelda game? Um, very few, if exactly. any. And I think that goes to the, the the storytelling mechanic of it. Well, what's the story? It's just, it's uh, Smash Brothers is fun, but it's not like I'm playing it for the story. I don't yeah. understand why fighting games have stories. And that's a, that's a, <laughs> a whole I think other I've thing. complained about that on, on the video game episode of Studio Demands It. It's like, I just want to punch. I don't care. I don't need to know what happened to Ryu. <laughs> I see. I think, I think you, this is interesting. You're giving me new thoughts right now as you speak about this. I, and I'm I think certainly, you're right. I'm I think, certainly happy to be wrong about this. Um, I don't want no, to no, say no, that. That uh, I'm sure there's people listening now who are like, I love the open world aspect of 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 Twilight Princess and Skyward well, and Sword. And then Twilight Princess is so weird because it has open world elements where it's li- literally mechanically streaming in data when you're moving through Hyrule Field. It, it streams in little chunks, mm-hmm. which they experimented with actually originally in Majora's Mask, where um, you know classically in Zelda game you go in and out of a door, fa- fades in and out or whatever. And the whole levels. Yeah, there, they're yeah. loading a clump. And then you work around in that clump and then you load another clump. Yeah. Um, in Majora's Mask, there's a few areas where they experimented with like, well, if we make this walkway really long, we can load the next section while the person walks there because yeah. we know it'll load in X amount of milliseconds right. or whatever. They can't move fast enough to catch us. Right. Whereas Breath of the Wild, the thing is constantly always streaming a, per- a proximity and then loading things in, which is how open world games work mm. these days. Um, Ocarina, oh, Twilight has a bit of that streaming engine but narratively uh, uh twilight is straight line yes it really this is. is the story you are going to un- turn the chapter there are portions in twilight princess where you are asked to literally follow a line of smoke <laughs> there you go <laughs> you know what i mean I, I i i'm not saying that they couldn't come up with a very definitive story for link to where it's cr- he he criti- like goes through an arc like cloud in final fantasy 7 where like or uh, uh, some uh, like Metal Gear Solid or whatnot, where it's like you're playing Snake. This is what he needs to do. Yeah. He's going to change and grow as a character. Uh, something like Chrono Trigger, which has very open narrative in terms of how you unfold the universe. Yeah, 
you can follow one. It's a choose your own adventure, but once you choose a path, you're stuck on that path. Um, you can have a character die and resurrect. Like, I'm not saying that they couldn't do it. I'm I'm pleasantly, I'm pleased that they haven't. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm when I said you were giving me new thoughts, you kind of helped me realize something, and I realized that it's not an issue of how do you make Link talk when he can't talk. It's a holistic approach in that you the d- the design of the game is such that Link shouldn't or the narrative Link shouldn't need you to shouldn't, talk. You shouldn't need to, and yeah. if you build a Zelda, if some, if one were to build a Zelda game where Link's narrative would require that and you had to get really clever, mm-hmm. the closest we've ever gotten was him telling a quick little story at fading in and out. Um, you're maybe arguably not building an on model Zelda game. It's it is yeah you're right it's it would be off off brand it would be off and i and i feel like it's a deliberate choice by them to have come this far 25 games with some shoot offs into mm-hmm. you know link is in uh yeah, 25 ish right 20, yeah um technically to, it's yeah sorry to to not we we did a, our super mario episode for mm-hmm. studio demands it and our stinger for our our franchise was to have them walk on in the Hyrule field and Link to r- w- run up on a, come up on a horse and like welcome to Hyrule, you need to help us with Ganon and like right. to our, our our notion there was like we're gonna have a Smash Brothers universe like right that was that was the extent of which we were willing to go to give Link a story specific to what he, uh, and I would posit yeah. that that Link that you guys were kind of just imagining right there at the end is yeah. like a as a really out there stinger at the end of the movie because right. I remember you had a lot of Mushroom Kingdom connections and it was really going well um, one could argue that maybe the stinger could be just other parts of because Mario has like maybe four or five different universes that they persist in there's mm-hmm. the whole you know like the Yoshi stuff and the whatever stuff but um, but anyway I as I was imagining as you were saying it I was interpreting that as like kind of post ocarina like the ocarina yes, universe yes, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean I I I just thought of something to yeah. kind of kind of cap this all off yeah I think we and, can do it and Link not having a voice and how important that is for the game series as a whole don't change a thing about any of the games mm-hmm. The sto- all the stories we yeah. do have. Yeah. Don't change Zelda. Don't change Ganon. Don't change anything. But now imagine playing that game with Mario. Yeah. <laughs> and what does that change? Because you know Mario's voice. Like, what does that change for how iconic Mario is as a character, as the red-headed blue overalls? I'm going to tell you, know, yeah. Who you? Hey, the princess. Oh, wah, 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 wah. Like, right. Um, how much change is just giving the game to Mario to play? Or we just played Beyond Good and Evil, and she does talk in that game, the main character, and she talks a lot. It's the one of the first video games I ever played where the character had a monologue, a, an actual wow, monologue. Okay. <laughs> and I was kind of touched by it. But of course, I don't have the same. I mean, Jade's cool. Jade's super cool. But I don't know if I, if, if in speaking about Beyond Good and Evil, I don't know if I would tell people like, and then I did this, yeah. and then I did this. Yeah. You know what I mean? It may, maybe you say I is semantics, but I'm always thinking like, okay, then I had to make Jade go do this, mm-hmm. I had to make Jade go do this. Yeah. So I, the the idea of a character with a voice like Mario mm-hmm. in in a Zelda to play Zelda, but now Mario like mod the game, so right. now Mario's playing it. You re you reassign so much of of your interpretation of the game. You you realign so much of your feelings of the game when suddenly it's it's Mario. Like I know I'm choosing well, wait, wait, Mario. We game. can use this. We can use this too. Even Zelda in Breath of the Wild, she has a she has voice performers. Right. I mean, maybe six or seven of them across the different languages. That there was a moment where it's people on the internet were expressing that they did or didn't care for that performance. Mm-hmm. I think it's perfectly fine. Um I'm not here to critique it, but I can see how that's that thing you speak to. If 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 it's close enough, people will accept it. And I think for the most part, Zelda's voice was. Mm-hmm. So when people say like, wow, they had all the other characters talk in Breath of the Wild. Why didn't Link talk? They could have just made him talk. Obviously, that's a choice. Right. And imagine even just Zelda, who's 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 a touch beloved. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe she's adjacent to the Link thing. You never, I mean, you occasionally control her, but that's not the point. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, if people had that much of a reaction even to now attaching a voice to a character that never had a voice, imagine if it is the Link situation, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, it's, you know, I'm sure we'll, in 
the next number of years or so. However, I mean, this is, I am to go back to my, even my thesis about the modern mythology of Mario and Link and of being video game myth myths that will exist far beyond our years. We'll probably eventually have another Zelda game where he, or a, a Zelda game where Link does speak. Well, we, like it'll we, happen eventually. Yeah. We might Maybe. get a completely different game mechanic where it, you are playing something much more, narrative based specifically to the main character of link that you are playing far more than we've ever seen before maybe um i would go so far as to say as I, I based on our conversation here i think nintendo is smart enough to i'll say never do that i think so too they'll I, put if they need to tell that story they'll put it on a character in that game that link will then experience i think so i think that it, to we have seen stories of Link. There may be people who've listened this whole time going, well, what about this and what about this? Mm -hmm. There are chapters in Link's adventure that you can you can ex exp like expound upon. Like think of the the crush of Zora and uh, yep. and like there's a little bit of a, a cute little meet cute love story that happens just in that microcosm of that adventure. Mm -hmm. And that's happened throughout the course of the Zelda games where there are little character moments uh, i think majora's mask is the largest one in terms of of link searching for his friend and yeah. lost in this world and and being compelled as the hero he is to save the city that's me prescribing a lot of how i feel about link onto the character but yeah. it is a a a more focused story that and that has happened over the course of these games um, interesting while still leaving it very open-ended to the audience to the player to become link and perhaps it's allowed Majora's Mask is another example where we do see Link in the prologue, you could say. Mm -hmm. But because we've already identified over 20 hours of this character from Ocarina, maybe that's acceptable. Yeah. It's an intermission almost. Because it is a sequel, yeah. So, well, and that's why it's all right. I know, we got to wrap this up. This was this was a lot of fun. This was I've never We've never done just like an open-ended conversation on this I, show. I hope the uh, the audience enjoyed the this sort of variety in, yeah, in the nice. show itself. Uh, having a, not necessarily, we didn't, not have a topic to discuss. We've we've little... You've given me three or four new ideas, honestly. Uh, all right. <laughs> just as we speak here, this was an absolute pleasure, TC. Um, let's let's. I guess let's do the uh, let's do the outro stuff here. Sure, sure. Um, if people want to find you or anything you do online, where could they do that? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at at TC's Big Head. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook if you want to find me there, TC Dewitt. Um, mm -hmm. Happy to, to chat or what have you. Uh, please check out Studio Demands It if you want to hear me talk at length about film with my my cohort, uh, Jim. Um, it's a, you know, if you love movies, if you love uh, wanting to kind of see how the sausage is made in terms of how stories are constructed from us from concept to screenplay to completion, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun, on-the-spot, development of film what excites me so much about that show is that okay fine there's there's one element of like oh how fun can Koda Goonies 2 movie be right let's try to make it the most successful or whatever but on a meta level what your show is about is the process of writing exactly you yeah, know what I mean that's actually what we're celebrating each episode is we do you do it in a fun way of like okay let's make it a really hard challenge let's you know what I mean mm -hmm. But really, the truth is, over the course of that hour that I that I am treated to listen to it, as I you know get the stuff all set up for putting things out there, um, it's really, it's really you're observing the writing process. Exactly, and that's yeah. what it's about. It's, I'm, I'm repeating myself. It's, it's the it it is the process of because it's not just like oh, wouldn't it be cool if such and such happened in a film? It's like yeah. well, how does that change the structure of a film how do you tell a complete story if it's if it's then godzilla punches king kong what you guys do is you're going but why why exactly yeah and and that's where jim and i are professional writers and we're constantly working in scenarios for clients where we are having to meet demands while still trying to maintain our creative integrity. Yeah. And uh, I'm not, I don't want it to sound all pompous and like, oh, look at me, we know what we're doing, because it really comes down to the fun of storytelling. And so what you do with Studio Demands It is you kind of crank it up to ridiculous yeah. as far as the demand yeah. and go with it and see what you can do. Just fine, Johnny Depp has to be in this. How are we going to do this? <laughs> so full disclosure, I'm going to, I'm going to take probably the first half of, of your uh, A Legend of Zelda episode. I'm yes. going to put it on as a bonus episode on our Zelda feed. It's not going to come off for a couple of weeks because your Legend of Zelda, even though we're recording that Legend of Zelda episode in a minute here, mm -hmm. um, and I have no idea how we're going to do it. 
like how we're going to fix, how we're going to make a Zelda don't, movie. Don't think about it. That's okay. the goal. We, gonna, we, I got to stay think, blank. Yeah. I got to stay blank. Blank slate. Um, Cause the only thing I'm bringing in is I think one shouldn't exist. Yes. And then we'll see where we go. <laughs> Leave it at that. Um, yeah. um, um, but that, that episode will be coming out around the time of our season finale of Zelda Perfect. season finale. So I'll talk to, I'll talk about it then a little bit more. So you won't see it as a bonus episode on our feed, like immediately after this episode audience, but I think I'm going to throw that on there. And then I invite people to go check out studio demands it in the meantime. Yeah. I, it's I, a lot of fun over there. I hope people can find some enjoyment. Uh, it's a nice mixed bag of of different franchises and movie properties you don't have to there's not me and jim might do some callbacks to previous gags we've done over the course of our f- season but uh for the most part i'd say choose your own uh pick pick what interests you and and give it a listen and i if was you, if, oh, you, yeah. if you want to listen to more thanks that's wonderful i i was i was touched a little bit when i was checking out your itunes reviews at studio demands it and one of them was titled another zelda podcast listener yeah and you're like oh this is great <laughs> such good ideas and i was like oh that's so wonderful you know people are experiencing the, the different parts of my universe that i get to work with you guys yeah. some of the audience is doing that as well thank you so much yeah very very cool so uh if people want to find me online I'm, I'm at raptor paint instagram twitter on discord i'm at raptor paint and the show uh if you have any thoughts about about anything that this was very open-ended this yes. is yes oh, i had yeah. a hard time closing this episode because i was like oh we could just kind of keep talking about this i'm sure we've we've hit something out there that you may have an opinion about and we'd love to hear it so if you can tweet at me at tc's big head or if you want to you know hit us up any any variation that you find necessary to do so do it because i'm sure we hit something that you're you have an opinion about and yes. i want to know it yes yeah. absolutely absolutely and uh people can find the show at uh, another zelda podcast.com or find us on twitter at another zelda pod and instagram another zelda podcast yes. twitter couldn't allow the whole thing ah. too many words <laughs> too many words and that's that's really most of it um thank you so much tc thanks david we'll uh We'll see you again sometime. I, I mean, hope so. I mean, our list, my listeners will hear you hosting me yes. in a couple months, and maybe they'll go, just go to studio. All right. That's cool. Let's get out of here. TC, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Kate usually ends with it. Okay, bye. Oh, okay, bye. <laughs> oh, we got it in there anyway. We got it in there anyway. <laughs> <laughs>